We're back in the book of Revelation, and so I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 12. So we're going to dig back in a little while here. Before we do that, I want to share a couple of things with you. Number one, please be in prayer for the family of Linda Evett. She passed away suddenly on Friday, and her funeral is today at 2 at Wallace Wilbanks. If you haven't had a chance to hear about that, it was sudden, and then uh, arrangements were made very quickly, and so... Please be in prayer for them, and if you would like to pay your respects, that service is today at 2 o'clock. The other thing is, is that uh, you should have received one of these in the mail recently. Uh, If uh, you're on our mailing list, if you're not, we've got extras. We'd love to give you one. And we'd love to invite you to be here tonight. Tonight, we are going to look at this. This is not just... Uh, newsletter or just information. We really put a lot of thought, prayer, and uh, planning into this document and what this represents for our church in this year. This is the 2023 ministry plan, and our hope and prayer is that God will uh, use the plans that you see here, the goals that we have marked out in this. Uh, We invite you to grab one and read Uh, from not just me, but many ministry leaders in our church. But you can come tonight and get a a taste of what all that's going to be like. Uh, Speaking of taste, there will be food there. So come and join us for that as well. It's at 5 p.m. And we are going to do something with our hands. And I don't want to give it away because I want you to come and see what it's like. It's totally fun. It's going to be awesome. But keep that in mind that if you come... You'll be participating in something that might get a little messy, so wear the appropriate type of clothing, okay? So is that enough to entice you and wet your whistle and you can come? It's not like super messy, but it could be, so we just want to make sure you don't wear like your best clothes and you're upset because we did this activity, all right? But come, it's going to be a lot of fun, and we got a lot of plans, and praying God blesses those. As a part of this document, we have a theme passage that we are going to utilize um, uh, quite often in our services and at other times. And so uh, I'd like, it's going to be on the screen, and I'd like for you to read this passage with me. It's Colossians, or Galatians, one of those, one of those, Galatians 4, 3 through 5. Would you read that with me aloud? In the same way, we also, when we were children... We're in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born unto the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. All right, so we will have that theme passage every uh, quite often, and we'll recite that together, and our prayer is that that will uh, be into our hearts and into our thoughts and minds as we seek to be what God has called us to be in 2023. So we're back into our study of Revelation today, and we're at the midway point, the exact midway point. We've looked at for several weeks um, and we took breaks because it's, it's a lot of information and heavy at times, and we'll continue doing that. We will close out the book of Revelation in 2023, I promise you, but it will be toward the end of 2023 because we're going to take some breaks as well. We're right in the middle of this, and we have looked at Revelation chapter 1 through 11, and in looking that, we have seen many things Greg Bill, a commentary writer that I re- I've read after as I've been studying this, states that chapters 1 through 11 have John alluding to the happenings that are seen in full in chapters 12 through 22. So we've really built some scaffolding to help us understand some of the strange things that might be hard to understand, we've been building that scaffolding all along by looking at chapters 1 through 11. This is a hinge point in the book of Revelation. And what we have seen 
teased and pointed to and alluded to in chapters 1 through 11 now comes to fruition, now comes to the forefront, and we see those things more fully and begin to understand them more fully. So as we begin looking into the fulfillment of what was alluded to in the first 11 chapters, let us remind ourselves of some of the principles that we have uh, had guiding us as we study the book of Revelations. Number one, this is, this is a unique type of literature in all of the Bible because it combines several things into it. Number one, it was a letter. It was a letter written to seven churches, literally in the breadbasket of society at the time, in the greatest place of, of uh, where all the things were happening in Asia Minor. And we see these seven churches that John was likely some type of overseer of. Uh, he visited them quite often. He had them on his heart as he's on the island of Patmos. And as God reveals to him these things that are coming... He has to share it with them. So it's a letter. It is also a prophecy, and it's important for us to understand it is written as a prophecy. There are things about a prophecy, and, and this is true of Old Testament prophecies, prophecy as well. There are aspects to prophecies that are going to take place kind of immediately, and then there are things that are going to take place in the distant future as well. I think particularly with us looking at Christmas recently. I think of Isaiah 9 chapter, or uh, yes, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and we see that. We know it. We, it's handles Messiah for unto us. A child is born, unto us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And those things came to fruition at Jesus' birth. So it was a prophecy that was fulfilled it was fulfilled in that day, and then there are aspects that will be fulfilled later. And that's the part of the government will be upon his shoulders, and we could call him, uh, and then and that all nations will bow before him. That is a piece of the prophecy still yet to come. So you must understand that Revelation has that aspect of things that have happened that are happening and things that will happen. The third type of literature this is that's kind of mushed together is the, the um, revelation is uh, apocryphal writing, right? It's, it is apocalypse, not apocryphal, apocalypse writing. Apocalypse simply means reveal, revelation, to vi reveal. That's why it's called the book of Revelation, right? To reveal, to reveal Christ. And that's what we've said from the beginning is this book is ultimately not just about something that will come. This book is about Jesus Christ, and that's why we are studying it. Though it is difficult, though it is hard, though it is taxing, if I'm uh, completely honest, we study it because there's aspects of our Savior, there's aspects of our Lord, there's aspects of Jesus Christ that we will not see unless we look at the book of Revelation. So we do that, and those principles guide us those things that we have seen another thing that we have seen in chapters 1 through 11 is that we see the coming onto the scene of jesus christ started and caused this cosmic battle to begin erupting we see the kingdom of jesus christ the coming one completely uh, clashing into the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. We see this cosmic battle raging and taking place between these two kingdoms. The lion presented as the slain lamb and his kingdom is coming into fulfillment and it's crashing into the kingdom of Satan and this world and the kingdom of of darkness this is a really this is a very legitimate and real battle as i have said that has raged is raging and will rage this is a very real battle that's happening today ephesians paul in ephesians tells us 
that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the principalities of the air. We wrestle against the spiritual realm. We wrestle against the unseen. This battle rages now because we see that Christ came onto the scene 2,000 years ago. We, we celebrated Advent for a whole season looking at the coming of Christ. And Christ came 2,000 years ago. He came and he lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and he died on a cross he did not deserve. And he rose again to accomplish all the things that he came to accomplish, to beat death, hell, and the grave for you, for me to accomplish victory for us. And when he did, the, the battle turned up a notch. The volume turned up even louder. And that battle continues to rage. Though we may not see it always, it is continuing to rage around us. It's important to remind ourselves that that's really what a prophecy does. It presents something that is somewhat happening, will usually have a soon fulfillment and will have an ultimate fulfillment. That's what John is envisioning in these passages. He's writing to seven churches in the breadbasket of the known world at his time, and we, and they are told and, and, and encouraged and admonished sometimes because they weren't doing a great job of it, but they're, John has said, you got to hold fast. you got to hold fast to the things that you've learned. you got to hold fast and stand uh, stand your ground because these clashing kingdoms are only going to clash more and more and more. And the same thing is true for you and I. Now, as we prepare ourselves to understand this passage and passages that follow, it's important for us to grasp Old Testament passages, New Testament passages that aren't related to this, and, and other things found in other books that John's readers and John's hearers would inherently have known. But you and I have to do a little digging and help ourselves and remind ourselves of those things. I'm hoping to do that today to help us understand what might somewhat be lost on us. And as we look to the Scriptures, and, and as we look to uh, many places in Scripture, I pray that it will help us have a better understanding of what's coming. May we re be reminded that the ruler of this present darkness and his mimic kingdom that is clashing with the kingdom of Christ, of which we are ambassadors, that that kingdom is failing and falling every moment. This may seem pretty heavy already, but it's not meant for us to be scared. Revelation is meant to in inject us with courage to continue on because in the end, Christ wins. The battle is raging, but Jesus has already won. Let's look at Scripture and let's see what's here and let's help pray that God will help our understanding and see what we need to see for our own lives. Would you read with me Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 6. And if you're able physically, would you stand? We want to honor the reading of God's Word. We want to revere it today because it is His Word. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and with a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor and agony as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male who was going to rule all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was called up to God and to his throne. The woman fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be nourished there for 1,260 days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He may be seated. There are four things that we must understand about the ruler of the mimic kingdom, Satan, our enemy. Number one, there's a real enemy to Jesus and his purposes. There's a real enemy. We've already talked about this a little bit. There is a real enemy that is, is enraged and he's fighting and he doesn't want Jesus' purposes to win. He doesn't want Jesus to win and he doesn't want 
Jesus' truth to go forth. He doesn't want Jesus to do anything. He doesn't want his kingdom to succeed. He doesn't want his kingdom to go to come, uh, to come and to flourish. He doesn't want that. So what does he do? He rages against it. He fights against it. We've been talking about spiritual warfare for the entire fall semester, and, and, and a lot of these things uh, uh, are, are true and, and, and overlap with other passages that we've studied, and we see really in this moment this this final fight that the the enemy pushes forward even though he's going to fail even though he knows the victory is won he's he's fighting as best he can in this moment in this passage john sees a similar display and it sounds familiar to us doesn't it a woman pregnant about to give birth to a, a son who will rule with an iron rod right I've titled this message, A Not-So-Holy Night. We studied uh, the Advent recently, and the Advent, we we called that series Holy Night. But we see, in a way, a peek behind the curtain of something that was happening that you and I couldn't see, and John got a glimpse of it. The moment that Christ was coming into his kingdom, coming to come and uh, bring about the kingdom of God and to bring about a way to be... to to repent of our sins and to be a part of his kingdom, to gather for himself a people, a people called by his name, a people uh, to go out in his name. And we see a peek behind this curtain of what was taking place that still solemn night that we so, uh, so revere and that we celebrated recently. But what we see is that as soon as Christ was coming on the king, on the scene, the enemy was enraged. We see that this woman is clothed with the sun, moon, and 12 stars on her head. That's familiar too. If you think about it, if you think about the Old Testament roots of this passage, we think about Joseph. You know him. He's the one that had the coat of many colors, the one who was favored by Israel, by his father, by Jacob. And you remember that he was a dreamer and that God gave him a dream. And what was in that dream? Sun, moon, 12 stars. Now in his dream, he happened to be one of those stars that shined a little brighter and all the others would bow down to him, even his mom and his dad. But we see that imagery and we understand that in this passage, what's happening and what this woman ultimately represents is she represents a people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. You and I have been grafted into the 12 tribes of Israel because that's what Scripture teaches us all over in Hebrews and other places that you and I, by our faith in Jesus Christ, we are a new Israel. We've been grafted into this family. It's the people of God. It's the people of God in this moment. Certainly, Mary is is seen here a little too. It's also alluding to her, but I think secondarily... And then in this passage, we see an enraged dragon, and he's trying, he knows that this baby is going to be born, this kingdom is going to come. He knows that this kingdom is going to come, and so he tries to head it off, is what the passage says, that he's going to come before it ever happens, and as soon as she gives birth to this child, he's going to devour the child and devour his kingdom. This imagery is of the enemy, Satan, thinking that he could somehow subvert the kingdom of God or stop the power of Jesus Christ. But we know he can't. We know that God has protected this family, this people, this this Savior. Look in the passage, Revelation chapter 12, and it says, And the dragon... Verse 4, and the dragon uh, stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She, however, gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Who does that sound like? How do we know that this is Jesus? Because we must know Old Testament Scripture. If we know Psalm 2, we know that this is 
and this goes back to Psalm 2 that says these exact words that Psalm 2, 7 through 9 says that there will be a son and he will rule all nations and that he will rule with a iron rod. This is Jesus. This is Jesus and this dragon is Satan trying to head off his kingdom. This real enemy of Jesus and his purposes is enraged because he does not like what is happening. And really, he knows that he has lost. He knows that the battle is lost. And so he's doing everything that he can. I'm thinking of an animal. And you, you may have seen this on National Geographic, maybe a YouTube video, or maybe even in real life. An animal when caught in a trap or caught in a difficult situation, what are they going to do? They're going to lash out. They're going to try best they can to save themselves if they can. We have a story. We, we, we saw that with one of our own dogs who got in a predicament with a, 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 a leash around him, got into a tough spot. We tried to help him, and what did he do? He lashed out against us. Not because he didn't love us, but because he was in a really tough situation. Uh, we, we're trying to get him out of it, and all he needed to do, his instinct was to fight back. That's what the dragon is doing. That's what the enemy is doing. He knows his time is up, but he's lashing out. He's enraged. He's doing all that he can to come against the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the coming one. He's angry with Jesus and he's angry with Jesus' purposes. And he's angry with Jesus' people carrying out his purposes. That's why they had to flee. That's why the woman, the people of God, had to flee to be, to be given respite, to give, be given care. So that they could be protected. And God protected, it protects his people and protects his, his message. I had an opportunity this week. Uh, I drove uh, a group of Georgia Baptist pastors and, and mission leaders from the state. There were seven of us. We went to Virginia, and we went to the International Mission Board Learning Center. It was a great week. Uh, I learned a lot about what our missionaries are doing, but the whole purpose of this learning, this missions college I went to, was to help churches like ours to understand the mission we have before us, the task that we have to to share the message of Jesus Christ, not, not only on the foreign mission field, but in the mission field that you and I have here in Lafayette, to help us to go to the highways and byways and take the message of Christ, to fulfill the purposes of Jesus Christ, to go on mission and push forward the message of Christ, and to push back the darkness of this world. I was reminded as uh, I read, uh, or uh, um, 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 a missionary gave a message in one of our worship times from Psalm 67, and I was reminded of something I know, of something I studied. It's, it's not just here in Psalm 67. It's also found in Genesis, uh, and it's also found in Numbers 6. It's found in, in Genesis 2. It's this mandate of, uh, of, of God blessing his people so that they will be a blessing to the nations, and it's found in, in Psalm 67. I want, I want you to see what the Word says in that passage in verses 1 through 4, Psalm 67, 1 through 4, and it says, May God be gracious to us and bless us. May He make His face to shine upon us, Selah, so that your way may, may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy, for you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Selah. What we see in this passage is the mandate that, that God has... Well, we see the heart of God. We see the heart of God to bless His people, you and me, so that we can be a blessing to those so that we can spread the message of salvation to the nations, to the peoples of all the world. God has a heart for the nations to come to Him. 
That is the purpose of God. That is the purpose that this, the enemy, that Satan is trying to thwart. That is the thing that Satan is raging against. That you and I would go to the world and share this gospel message and that people like you and me, when we heard the message of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit quickened our hearts and we believed in him and we were saved, that you and I could take that same message across the entire world and that people would be coming to Christ in the droves every day on the mission field, but even here. That is the purpose that we fulfill. That is the thing that you and I go forth with. And that's why this, the enemy wants to put a stop to it. My heart for our church this year, and I don't want to give it all to you because I want you to come tonight, but one of the things you're going to hear is that I feel so strongly, so strongly, from God, from the Lord, that we have to go on mission. I don't mean a mission trip. Now, there might be some of those, but that could be to the apartment complex here or there or in our town. It could be to those who need it most that, that we go to our neighbors just across the street, knock on the door. But my heart, what I think the Lord has given us this year is to make his name known in this town that God would be glorified and that he would draw people to himself because of your witness and my witness. It's what we're called to already, but I think we emphasize that this year. That's what I feel so strongly from our Lord. And I hope you'll join me in that. I'd love for you to be here tonight to hear more about that. The second thing we see in this, that, that we need one of these four things that we must understand about the ruler of the mimic kingdom, our, our enemy, Satan, is the number two, the enemy initiates trials and persecutions of Jesus' followers. We were, we were able to be in these breakout sessions and hear not just from the presenters. The presenters were missionaries uh, from the field. They came to teach these classes, but there were other missionaries in the field, some from hard places that they had to leave during COVID and haven't yet gone back like China because of the persecution there. And we're able to hear the hardships, difficulties, hard stories, but we're able to hear how God uses those trials and persecutions to bring people to faith in him. Heard a story of a, a man who, who several years ago after the, at the, after the Haitian earthquake so many years ago, who he and his family uh, left as refugees, made their way to Brazil. And uh, because Brazil was open, but it wasn't very helpful, they ended up hitchhiking. And they made it all the way to the Mexican and United States border, where it helped there and ended up in North Carolina. There was moments where this man was very little money in his pocket with a special needs son on his back and with um, very little food in his stomach made his way through jungle stepping over dead bodies along the way who had thousands of dollars in their pocket but no food on their stomach trying to find help just the way he did and God brought him to this place. He's in North Carolina now trying to find a way to get an extension on a visa. It's just a difficult situation, but he loves the Lord and is helping to serve a church there. He was there. He, we heard his story. It was, it was moving. And even in the midst of his trial and his difficulty and his persecution and the midst of tough times, the enemy raging in those areas, he was able to pervade and persevere and see God work in amazing ways. This idea of him, the enemy, initiating trials and persecutions of Jesus' followers is going to flesh out more going forward of what that might look like in, in Revelation. But remember, the enemy is already doing this now. Jesus in Matthew 5 said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. 
We will have trials. We will endure tough times because we have an enemy that hates that we get what he wanted. You see, the enemy wanted equality with God. You and I are called joint heirs with Christ. Not because of anything of our own, any of merit of our own. We are called that. We are a holy, a royal priesthood, a holy nation because God has made us those things. And Satan hates that. And so he rages against us. That's what he wanted. He wanted it for himself not to share with anyone. And we get to share in that, not because of ourselves, but because of Christ. The third thing we see here is that the enemy is enraged because his time is limited. We kind of already talked about this, but I want to point out that the enemy is mad. Satan is mad because he knows his time is up. He rages even though the battle is won, but he's not going down without a fight. So, trials will come, but God uses these things to advance his kingdom because the victory is won through Christ. The fourth thing we see, the enemy is and will be defeated because Jesus is victorious. This is that truth that we must hang on because this, this is tough, this is hard. I mean, trials and persecutions, you know, no thank you. But at the end of the day, Christ is victorious. We must remember that this will all eventually end because the enemy is being defeated and will be defeated ultimately because the coming one has already won. He's the Lion of Judah and the only one worthy. He came as a slaughtered lamb because of the sacrifice that he gave. He accomplished victory for you and for me. In this passage of Scripture, it briefly tells us what he did because that's not the point. We already know that he's won. We saw that in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. But what it says, she gave birth to a son, a male who was going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was called up to God and to his throne. It's a pretty short, abbreviated version of Jesus' life, isn't it? That he was called up to God and to his throne. But it is an abbreviated story. It's not the only place this happens. It happens many other places in Paul's writings as well. He has accomplished victory for you and me. I love 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. It's on the screen. I want you to see this as I read it. And this is what it says, and this is the hope that you and I have. Yes, trials, persecutions, difficulties are coming because the enemy doesn't like us. He doesn't like what we stand for. He doesn't like that we get to do what he would love to do. We, he, doesn't get, he doesn't like that. But what Paul tells the Corinthian church, and I think this is for us as well, he says, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Friends, our hope, our hope is in the eternal life that is brought about by our Savior. Our hope is not in can I be good enough can I do enough good works? Can I do enough to outweigh the bad in my life? Nope. Because guess what? There's not enough good that you can do that will outweigh the punishment you and I deserve. Our hope has nothing to do with what you or I can do for God. Our hope is that at the end of our lives, we will be found in Him. You don't have to wait to the end of your life to find that out. You don't have to wait till trials and persecutions come. You don't have to wait till, uh, till you know, the things in Revelation begin unfolding more, in more intensity. You don't have to wait to just wonder, where am I at? No, you can have hope. You can have peace. You can know you can't just like, well, I think I know. No, you can know. 
that you are found in Christ. You can be found in Christ today and know that because you are found in Him, when He comes again or when we face Him face to face, you can know for certain, know for certain that you are found in Him. And it has nothing to do with you or me and what we can do. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. His death, burial, resurrection. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God and He is offering you because, remember, He loves the nations. His salvation message rings out among us all so that we can hear it, receive it, and find our hope in Him. You don't have to guess you can know that your sins are covered, that you are found in Christ. And when the time comes, you will find your rest in Him in eternity. And that seems almost too good to be true. And can I tell you, it's just real simple to find Number one, you have to realize there's nothing you can do in your own strength that will accomplish that for you. But only Christ and you trusting in Him brings that about in your life. So what that looks like, something very simple. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. It's wrong in your sight. I don't have a chance. It was up to me. I'm... I'm out of luck. But I know that Christ did what I could not do. And so God, would you exchange what Christ did and what I could not do, would you flip those around? And would you, as Christ has said, he who became sin, who he, he who knew no sin became sin for you, and would you... Let that be for me. What Christ did on the cross, would it be mine in Him? And would He get the bad end of the deal and get my sin? So it can just sound real simple, like, Jesus, I can't, but I know you can. Will you? So friends, if you, that's here, you're here today, you're maybe watching online, and that's you, you want to trust Christ today. Please trust Christ today. Just call out to Him. The Bible is very clear. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call to Him today. Call for Him to save you today. If you did that today, I'd love to share with you. I'll be out in the lobby in just a few moments, or you can come right here if you want to. But I'd love to share with you, talk with you, have a conversation with you. Maybe you're online or maybe you're just in the room and you'd rather do that digitally. You can just send the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 423-455-9458. And I'll start a conversation I'd love to share with you and help you to trust Christ as your Savior today. The rest of us, those of us who already know, many of us, some, some have been Christians for a long time. What do we take from this? What do we go out with? Number one, we, we go out that we carry the purposes of God. We go to the highways and byways with the greatest message ever told, and it works. When we proclaim, people will come. So I pray in 2023 and today and next week and tomorrow that God will give us boldness, give us a heart. Pray for someone that you can share Christ with. Pray for someone that you feel like God is laying on your heart to to love and to lead and to invite to church and to whatever you can to help them to come to know Him. But I pray that we would also live in the victory we have in Christ because what Christ did, no matter what trials come, no matter what difficulties we face, and listen, I know many of us, I know many of you are facing real tough challenges, but those light momentary afflictions will soon pass away and help us, Lord, help us focus on eternity, not what is seen in the here and now. I pray God will work in our hearts today. If he's working in your heart, you come. I'd love to talk with you, either up here or afterwards. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you, Jesus.
for the truth found in your word. Thank you for what you've called us to, what, what you've done to save us, Lord, what you've done to give us victory in you over the enemy who wants to do everything he can to thwart what you're trying to do, to overcome it, to subvert it. And help us, Lord, to endure, persevere, and look to heaven and try to bring others with us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing. And if God is moving in your heart, would you follow him whatever way he's leading you? And I'd love to share with you outside or up here, whatever chance you get. Let's sing.